These days, the image you have as an artist and entertainer can make or break your career. It's everything. Many rappers realize this and decide that the only way they're gonna make it is by fabricating their image in order to succeed. However, to pull it off, they have to keep this a secret, as fans hate fake images. And when they find out, those same fans often turn on the rappers themselves, leading to the question, who are these rappers? How did they pull it off for so long? And how were they caught? I'm Rashad Fashir, and this is Rappers Who Fake Their Images. The first rapper on this list who's been notorious for faking their image is none other than Lil Mabu, a teenage rapper who since 2021 has amassed millions of followers across all platforms and over 100 million streams on both Spotify and YouTube alone, all while being independent, and with some very notable cosigns in rap, such as from PNB Rock, K Flock, Lil Durk, Bavio Foreign, and many others. So how did this innocent looking white kid become one of New York Drill's biggest rappers? Well, to understand that, we have to go to the very beginning. Lil Mabu was just a teenage rap fan like millions of others in the world but today mabu regularly goes viral for looking and behaving like a drill rapper but what if i told you this was all by design what many don't know is that mabu actually founded a marketing company at 15 and would help rappers blow up with social media mabu's company would successfully boost artists like lil keed and 42 doug's careers expanding their audience by using a plethora of social media marketing such as short form video content and viral memes. sound familiar and mabu would be quite successful running his marketing agents however he would wouldn't want to stay behind the scenes forever. So around this time, while Mabu was promoting these larger artists, Mabu was also experimenting with his own music. He'd casually upload songs to SoundCloud, however, this didn't work out, as his music wasn't great and he just didn't have the image for it that was required to blow up in the rap scene. So after multiple failed attempts to try and make it by being himself, Mabu decided he would come out and try something different. This was in 2021, the year after 2020, where the hard-hitting style of production and flows of drill rap had conquered New York. So Mabu decided that he would try his hand at it, and to his surprise, his first Joe song, Move It, caught a decent amount of attention, getting 100,000 views, which is more than pretty good. However, things didn't work out how he thought they would. He quickly realized that the song wasn't good enough to catch people's attention. Yeah, he might have gotten some views, but it wasn't good enough to blow up off of the merit of the music alone. So after realizing that a white kid couldn't just rap on a drill beat and skyrocket to success, he decided to take a page out of his old marketing playbook and turn it up a notch. Four months later, he dropped his new song, Demon Time. This time, his voice was a lot deeper, and there was a video shot in the streets of New York featuring Lil Mabu dancing while surrounded by goons. It worked, and comments on the video really liked the song. They didn't mind he was a white kid, because it was clear he was just having fun, and they encouraged him to keep going. And Mabu did just that. In his next video, King of the World, he did the same thing, paying people to act tough behind him and pretend like they were his goons. It was pretty successful, and today, King of the World sits at 1.7 million views. However, it didn't get as many views as his song Demon Time did. So Mabu quickly realized that clearly one simple gimmick wasn't enough to blow up. He needed more steam behind his career. So he may not have found the formula to his mainstream success, but he did find one ingredient, a fabricated gangster image to catch people's eyes. So he'd once again take another page out of his old marketing playbook and use short form content, aka TikTok, to try and boost his career. He realized he couldn't compete with the actual rappers who were living that life. So Mabu, like many white rappers, used his skin color to his advantage, but not how you'd think a white rapper would. He'd promote his early music by posting TikToks and videos of him mentioning his skin color, but he'd make fun of himself. And by doing this, it was hard for others to do the same thing. And once again, it worked. He'd get millions of views to short form, but once again, it didn't work quite the way he wanted. You see, Mabu's silly image may have gotten him some views, but Mabu knew to really succeed, he needed to be taken seriously. So he went back to the drawing board, and this time, he didn't have anything from his old playbook to take out of. He was out of pages. So what did he come up with? Mabu decided that if he couldn't actually be a gangster, he would hang out with and make as many songs as he could with real gangsters to boost his credibility and get him more exposure. And that's exactly what he did. The first rapper Mabu enlisted to help bolster his gangster image was none other than the barbershop demon K Flock, who's currently sitting in Rikers, facing life in prison. So clearly he's not an innocent dude. Mabu would pay K Flock to hang out in the studio with them, as he was already respected and established in the New York drill scene. As you can see, Mabu is trying his best to play the part of a drill demon, and most drill fans' reaction at the time was, who is this white kid? Fast forward a couple weeks, and K Flock was arrested on some pretty serious charges, and this is where most fans believe that Mabu crossed the line. You see, even after involving himself with the drill rapper, Mabu felt like his antics weren't enough to get the amount of attention he deserved, so he decided to take things a step further by directing involving himself in New York drill rap street beef, a very dangerous game. These drill rap videos are causing young people to lose their lives. How did he do it? Block had an enemy or what some people call an op 
D-Thang, and a week after K-Flock's arrest, Mabu decided to betray K-Flock and previewed his song with his op D-Thang. This move was met with a ton of backlash, as ironic as it sounds, values are very important to deadly gang members, so Mabu tried to play it off telling D-Thang he ruined the song. Then D-Thang got arrested on Rico charges too, and pretty soon everyone forgot about it. But regardless of everyone's opinion on Mabu, he had found a way to grab people's attention for real this time. Now he just needed it to work. So Mabu decided to try again, this time with Shai K, another one of K-Flock's ops, and a respected drill rapper from New York. Except rather than turning it down, Mabu decided to go as hard as he possibly could, and he would release a song with Shai K called Everyone K. Except it wasn't your average paid feature. Mabu had intentionally put himself in the middle of a series beef. The song was a diss toward one of Shai K's enemies or ops, Yus G's, and despite not being gangster at all, Mabu was even talking trash to use in the song, saying things like, you just broke in the hood, so you better get comfy. Since he knew he could hide behind a wall of gangsters who he was using for his image. And from then on, Mabu using street rappers for credibility would become a common theme in his music. He realized that all he needed was others to back him and he would be good. Right after dropping the diss on Yus G's, Mabu dropped his debut album, and the promotion worked. It was filled with features from established drill rappers, who funnily enough, all had beef with each other, but I guess none of them were willing to turn down Mabu's money. By then, Mabu had secured features from almost every popular and up and coming drill rapper in New York, and he was starting to become a household name in the drill scene. Two weeks later, he dropped his next video featuring Dusty Locaine, another respected New York rapper, with the song No Snitching. And this time, Mabu received the virality he was looking for when he first started. No Snitching went viral on all platforms. Firstly, the song was pretty good, but it was mainly because Mabu was really starting to act the part of a drill rapper. In the music, he was holding a blade with a laser, and the lyric, I can never snitch, that's on my kids, which he'd obviously do, but it didn't matter, went viral. Mabu's goal was to get people talking and sharing his videos, and this is exactly what people were doing. His plan was working. But Mabu was smart. He understood that historically in rap, especially in recent times, gimmick rappers were able to see copious amounts of success, but after using the same trick multiple times, the public would get tired of them and they'd fall off, because no one wants to see a one-trick pony more than a couple of times. And Mabu understood this. He didn't want to become a one-trick pony and fall off, so he decided to alter his formula, and still pay for features, but he used a different sound. The next rapper Mabu decided to enlist for a feature was none other than Didi Osama, the problematic teenage New York drill rapper. With both rappers around the same age, and having similar fan bases, they were bound to make some noise together. They dropped the song Throw with a video that caught everyone's attention. Except this time, for half of the song, Mabu was singing melodically, not rapping like an aggressive drill rapper. However, to cancel this out, he decided to make the music video about getting run up on at a corner store. This turned out to be a genius marketing move. The song went super viral, and today it sits at close to 50 million plays on Spotify. It did so well that it actually got the attention of Lil Durk, and he allowed them to open up in front of 10,000 people. So the Mabu experiment was working more than ever. He couldn't stop going viral, and things were looking good. But that was still what's considered his come up. 2023 was even crazier for Lil Mabu, and more importantly, his image. Right from the jump, in 2023, Mabu went viral once again. This time, it turned out to be the most well-received work by him in a long time. He started off the year strong, dropping Mathematical Disrespect, which would chart on Billboard, but the following month, he'd make his first major move of the year, releasing Trip to the Hood. This time, there were no features, just a bunch of people who he paid from the hood to act like goons for the music video. This was a risk, as Mabu had never promoted a solo hit of his this hard since the beginning of his career, but it turned out to be a success. Today, it's sitting at 20 million views, and with that success, Mabu solidified his name in the drill scene. So Mabu thought, why not try and drop another solo song, as he had proved he could release successful music alone. This time, Mabu may not have faked his image, but he faked a story. He took to Instagram Live and trolled his audience. According to him, parents and students from his school were reporting Mabu, claiming that he was a danger to the school and a distraction to the students. Mabu decided to feed into this and used Instagram Live as a promotion. So with the hype at an all-time high, he dropped his new song, Rich Scholar, that dropped the next day. It was massively successful. It hit 20 million views, went viral, the usual, and it looked like everything Mambu had wanted had come to fruition. Money, fame, girls, you name it. You'd expect him to be ecstatic and rejoice, right? However, after this video, Mabu took a break from releasing music and posting himself for a while. Why? Well, it was because just as he received all the success, a media platform, the New York Post, published a hit piece on Mabu. All the fake image stuff eventually caught up to him, and what they found was quite shocking. Everyone knew Lil Mabu wasn't really about that life, but after the article was published, fans of New York Drill were shocked. It turned out that Matthew DeLuca, Lil Mabu's real name, wasn't a thug from the streets, if that wasn't obvious. He was the complete opposite. Growing up, he had it good. He attended 
attended a Manhattan private school that cost about $56,000 a year, and he was actually a model student. Furthermore, he grew up wealthy, growing up at his parents' 5-bed, five 5-bath, five 3,000 square foot condo on the Upper East Side. During school breaks or weekends, he often visited the Hamptons, where his family owns a 6,000 square foot mansion in Water Mill, and the two properties are worth upwards of 12 million. After hearing this, fans were appalled. Some were outraged, some were really surprised, but for the most part, everyone was just really shocked. But the hit piece had more information on Mabu. They claimed that Mabu's father, who had served a character in many of Mabu's music videos and still does, was a major music executive for a record label, which would explain Mabu's quick money and rise in fame. Mabu had hinted that he wasn't being totally honest in his songs, like in Mathematical Disrespect where he said, at least I get paid because a lot of these rappers are capping for free, hinting that he was lying, but fans didn't think it was this bad. They just thought he was embellishing certain things. It turned out Mabu's family was loaded. So now, it was on Mabu to respond to that expose and save his reputation. And after taking a long break from the public eye, he did exactly that. Months later, Mabu put out a video where he was being vulnerable and talking about his life situation. He explained that sacrifices I've made to get to this point at a young age. And you know, I, I was fresh out of high school with a song on Billboard, artists I look up to start becoming my friends, gaining notoriety, cool. But at what cost? announced that he was going to college instead of signing a record label deal, which happened to be Emory University, a college with an annual tuition of 75000 But he did address the hit piece partially, debunking the notion that his father was ever a big shot in the music industry, explaining that his father never got a chance to go to college, and that's why he was going himself. But if you think Lil Mabu was just about to let all this buzz around his name go to waste and not promote another song, you're bugging. Just 10 days later, Mabu released the music video for At What Cost, where he questions the ethics of what he did, exploiting other people's culture for his own success, saying, can't help but look around and say, this is where I belong, but at what cost? The song didn't do that well, only getting a couple million views, which was bad for Mabu's standards at that point. So it was clear he needed some type of spark to get his popularity back up. So he decided to go all out again. And his next song in video would probably be his most ignorant and aggressive yet. This time, he enlisted the help of Christian Rock. This was textbook Mabu marketing, putting himself in the middle of a messy situation. At least this time, it wasn't street beef though. It was the beef that Christian Rock and Blueface were having after breaking up during Christian's birth of their child. If you have any type of social media, you've probably seen the insane story of Blueface and Christian. The two used to be a hip hop power couple, having their entire lives on camera, until things quickly went south and they got into a pretty heated beef. Mabu knew this and realized it was going to be a great situation to throw himself into. At the time, Christian was constantly going viral. So with that, paired with Mabu's expertise, he thought they could easily make a hit song. And they did. They dropped the song at the end of 2023, and in just three months, the music video had racked up over 40 million views. It has over 100 million streams, and the song became ultra viral on TikTok. It was really just a two minute diss to Blueface. Mabu even promoted the song by acting like they were intimate, photoshopping Mabu's name over Blueface's name on her tattoos. So the song was a hit, and Mabu had successfully made a comeback. Maybe not popularity wise, but reputation wise. However, that wouldn't last very long. Afterwards, Christian and Rock talked about Mabu and the entire situation, not really speaking about him in the best light. She took to Instagram Live and said, I f him, bro, but I see his vision. I'm yeah. like, all right, let's go. But it was like, Okay, hold up. Yeah. Furthermore, on the live stream, Christian explained that she was uncomfortable during the entire video shoot because Mabu was doing too much physically. She said that he'd implied that he wanted her to throw it back on him, but she'd be too uncomfortable since she didn't know him like that and he was a lot younger than her as well. So it was clear Mabu had just used Christian for virality and didn't care if it made her uncomfortable. But hey, at least his career was back on track. So after everything he'd been through, Mabu had successfully thrown himself back into the spotlight, but he still had to maintain his virality. And as viral artists' careers progress, it becomes harder and harder to create those viral moments. So Mabu would be up for a challenge. However, his next video would be his biggest debut to date. Mabu would invite Fabio Foreign to his dorm room, and together they'd make a song called Teach Me How to Drill. The song was crazy. Fabio even says the N word for Mabu, and to say it went viral would be an understatement. The moment it released, it went crazy, going number one trending on YouTube music and getting 10 million views in 10 days. Furthermore, it began to go viral on TikTok as well, and the song is still blowing up to this day. So that brings us to today, where Mabu is the definition of a culture vulture, whether you think that's a bad thing or not. The culture he chose to insert himself into was drill rap, when he had nothing to do with the lifestyle beforehand. To me, drill music comes from pain, crime, death, and trauma, an art form that came from struggle. Lil Mabu, or Matthew DeLuca, has nothing to do with that, and it doesn't seem like Mabu will ever stop. 
His consistent ability to go viral is what fuels his relevancy, and because of that, many rappers recognize his ability to grab virality out of thin air, and that's why you see so many street rappers are happy to work with them. You can say Mabu uses the rappers for views, but they're doing the same thing with him, so they have an odd symbiotic relationship. Lastly, Mabu is only 18 years old, so as rap fans, we're going to be seeing his face for a long time. The next rapper who faked their image is none other than the infamous 6 9 and it goes incredibly deep, so sit back grab some popcorn and enjoy. A lot of people know the story of how 6 9 snitched and how he used gang members to prop up an image, but what they don't tell you is that his entire identity was stolen from the very beginning. 6 9s image is obviously the most memorable thing about him, his crazy tattoos, his hair, his loud jewelry and clothing. All of it plays a role in his overall character, but he didn't just randomly achieve this wild image. What a lot of people don't know is that 6 9s infamous image is from two individuals who would have their own successful rap careers later down the road, Zilla Kami and Sauce Mula, who now make up the hardcore rap group City Morgue. But at one point, both Zilla Kami and Sauce Mula were very close with 6ix9ine. They all met through family, and when they first linked up, Zilla Kami would actually ghostwrite for 6ix9ine. Because 6ix9ine wasn't about that life, he needed Zilla Kami and Sauce Mula to portray the image that he knew would get him attention. Sauce Mula was a known blood, and 6ix9ine was just previously affiliated with Crip. Not actually, he was just faking it. So seeing that Sauce Mula had the image that 6ix9ine wanted, he was a gang member, he had the face tattoos first, and had the aggressive delivery in his raps that people loved, 6ix9ine wanted to emulate it. Prior to that, 6ix9ine was rapping over Boom Bat. On top of that, he also dressed like a regular person. However, after meeting Sauce Mula, he decided to dye his hair and wear rainbow grills as well as use Sauce Mula's scream rap sound. So in other words, 6 ix entire image and persona was crafted by stealing others' aesthetics early on. But because they were his quote unquote friends, it was okay. So 6 ix was making noise locally and him and his trio's future was looking bright. However, it wouldn't last for long. The early clout came to a halt when he was arrested for messing around with someone who, um, wasn't 18. 6 9 was even seen in a photograph with her. He claimed he wasn't aware of the girl's age, but had to plead guilty so he wouldn't have to register as a sex offender. He spent a few months in Rikers Island jail and was eventually bailed out by Sosmula and Zilla. However, due to the seriousness of the allegations against 6 9 and the fact that he stole a lot of their belongings, he fell out with the people who wrote all of his music and practically crafted his image. So much so that after they fell out, those same friends trademarked the name Takashi 6 9 forcing 6 9 to change his name to 6 9 what we all know him as today. Though 6 9 did get the trademark back two years later, it's crazy to think that his old crew literally legally owned and were responsible for his entire image. But luckily for 6 9 he was able to get away with all this. Like I said, he changed his name and his old friends weren't interested in exposing him. So 6 9 would go on and become friends with Trippy Red and have his first big hit, Poles 1469. However, Trippy didn't know this at the time, but the only reason they were messing with each other was because 6 9 was faking that he was blood, something that he had stolen from his old friends. Eventually, Trippy realized 6 9 was weird and not a real blood, and they fell out as well. But 6 9 was still relatively unknown. Sure, he had made some moves, gotten some attention and views with Trippy, but he wasn't really pulling in numbers like that, especially not solo. But everything changed for 6 9 on one fateful day when he released his next song, Gummo. The video portrayed him on the block with around 100 bloods, including himself with a red bandana. To most, he seemed like a real gangster who could rap. It shot him to the mainstream, and today, the video has almost half a billion views on YouTube. But what a lot of people didn't realize is that 6 9 had completely fabricated the blood image. Except this time, it wasn't with Sauce Mula and Zilakami. It was with some other bloods. And what's interesting is he also tried to fake being a crip, but the crips he was with were like, hold up, and told him to stick to music. However, 6 9 realized that his image was important. So rather than respect the boundary they set, he just switched gangs. So he realized he needed to be a gang member to legitimize his wild antics and joined another gang, the Nine Trey Bloods, a blood set that originated in New York in the early 90s. And luckily for him, he met two members of the Nine Trey Bloods named Seko Billy and Snow Billy. They knew he wasn't a gangster, but they did see that he had a lot of potential to make it big in rap and believed that they could get a cut once 6 9 blew up. So when 6 9 told them that he had a new song, that he was going to shoot a music video for, and believed would become his first hit, Snow and Seko Billy would get all of their 9 Trey homies to show up to 6 ix 9s music video for his breakout hit, Gummo. And like I said before, the mainstream attention finally started to hit 6 ix 9 After the success, the 9 Trey bloods were ecstatic, and 6 ix 9 knew that they had to keep the partnership going. So they introduced 6 ix 9 to their leader, Shadi, or at least of their set. Shadi was another respected 9 Trey blood member, notorious for his involvement in crimes. He didn't get the nickname from the sky, he allegedly shot 5 
five people in just one day. So he and 6ix9ine cut a deal. 6ix9ine would use him and the rest of the 9 Trey Bloods to prop up his image as a gangster who was affiliated with Bloods and get protection from Shoddy and the gang. In return, Shoddy would become 6ix9ine's manager and get a cut of all of his earnings. After that, 6ix9ine would go on a series of hits. He was on fire and his success streak was undeniably, I won't say legendary, but pretty memorable. As for the 9 Trey Bloods, well, they didn't just have themselves a new member. They had a cash cow, taking a good percentage of 6ix9ine's earnings to not only fund their lifestyles, but their crimes. But they weren't just negotiating business deals and recording hits though. Treyway slash 9 Trey still had a heavy presence in the streets, and they would also have to keep up their end of the bargain and protect 6ix9ine. So they would have countless confrontations with 6ix9ine's enemies who they had to protect due to his insane amount of trolling, such as Chief Keef and more. And this is where the fake image would really come into play. 6ix9ine was the king of dodging and ducking. What do I mean? 6ix9ine would pretend like he was really like that and go into his ops hoods. For example, during a beef with what seemed like 6ix9ine versus Chicago, he infamously stepped onto Oblock turf to disrespect the soil. This was during his issues with Chief Keef, Lil Reese, FBG Duck, and pretty much all of Chicago's rap scene. However, after it was all said and done, a security guard for Oblock posted the surveillance footage showing that it was actually 3am and that he only stuck around for less than a minute before getting back into the car and driving off. In a later interview, 6 ix 9 did admit he was scared. It's chilling. Cause now we saw the surveillance video. He was there for like 30 seconds. Nah, it was actually like for like 15. <laughs> I'm gonna sit there and entertain y'all, but I'm not gonna sit there and d for y'all. That's not no, what that's what but, but at the time, he was talking the talk and pretending to walk the walk. And this isn't the only time he'd pop out at a location either. He did it multiple times, like when he was beefing with LA street rappers. In 2018, 6 ix 9 took to Instagram and posted a video of him flexing on his haters while outside in LA. However, he wasn't in LA at all. It was debunked by the media that he was in Houston, Texas, completely lying about being outside in LA. So he was just faking that he was about it and ready to slide, when in reality, he was just a scared little civilian. But since he still had the backing of the 9 Trey Bloods, no one could say anything as they were real gangsters. And as long as 6 9 and them were cool, he was cool. But as we all know, that couldn't and wouldn't last forever. The 9 Trey Bloods had been functioning since the 90s, but 6 9 helped put them in a new spotlight with the feds watching very closely. The 9 Trey Bloods were menacing gangsters and didn't have the cleanest crimes. They'd be caught on camera multiple times, just outright committing crimes in broad daylight. So when the feds had enough evidence, on November 18th, 2018, five 9 Trey Bloods, including 6 9 were arrested and indicted on charges related to racketeering, weapons possession, and conspiracy to commit murder. This included Shoddy and multiple people that held 6 9 down. It turned out the feds had been collecting evidence for quite some time, and 6 9 had expedited the process quite a bit. They decided to hit the 9 Trey Bloods with a RICO, and the 9 Trey trial would commence. This was a huge moment for 6 9 though. He had been LARPing as a real bud for a while now, so this was a moment for him to prove himself. So most people believed he would hold it down and solidify his reputation as a real gangster. Nope, rather than do what I just said, 6ix9ine pleaded not guilty to all charges and snitched on every member of Treyway, literally putting the most senior members in jail for the rest of their lives. The same ones that protected him and helped prop up his image. So long story short, 6ix9ine snitched and helped assist the process of taking down an established gang that has been around since the early 90s, or at least one of their most prominent sets. And not only did he get reduced charges, he caused everyone else to get much heavier charges and sentencing. But 6ix9ine knew all along that he needed snitch. His sentence was reduced to two years and he was out even earlier because of the coronavirus, practically getting a get out of jail free card. At the time, this was a huge deal. Everyone was calling him a snitch, a rat, and his reputation was in shambles. The fake gangster image was done for, and to the fans and the public, it was time for 6ix9ine to pay the price. Except his success with music wouldn't come to an end. Following his release, 6ix9ine dropped Gooba and it shook the world. The song hit number one on Billboard and the music video is now sitting at close to 900 million views. Then he dropped Trolls with Nicki Minaj, which also went number one and has 500 million views on YouTube. Together, the songs raked up billions of streams and views, so it's safe to say he was bigger than ever. But no one can run away from karma forever. Remember how I said 6 ix 9 would have to pay the price? He did. And remember how 6 ix 9 infamously asked people to test him? They did. There are countless instances where 6 ix 9 would boast and harass his enemies before and after his prison stay, saying he'll never be harmed. And surprisingly, he was right for a while. But of course, things caught up to him. One day, 6 ix 9 was alone in an LA fitness gym working out. Don't ask me what he was doing all alone in an LA fitness gym working out, but he was. And he was ruthlessly given the beats. So after many years of 6 9 faking his image, things finally caught up to him and his haters would have the last laugh. From there, 6 9 had a meteoric fall off. He no longer had a fake image to prop up his career. 
and the music alone wasn't enough for him to stay relevant. Today, people are sick of his antics as well as his music as it just isn't as special as it used to be and he can't be taken seriously anymore. However, he's still big enough to play massive festivals overseas and pull in millions of dollars. So the whole faking your image thing didn't work out too poorly, right? The final artist with a wild fabricated image belongs to none other than Punchmate Dev, the internet's favorite scammer. Dev has made a ton of noise in 2023 and is infamous for his scamming tutorials and strategies, but what if I told you that his image isn't what it seems? However, before we talk about how he climbed the scam rap hierarchy as a suburban kid from Kentucky, we have to talk about Punchmade Dev's rise. Far before Dev began making music, he started a YouTube channel at only 15 years old, where he'd actually conduct scams as well. His channel was mainly about 2K videos, a popular basketball video game, going under the moniker of Dev Take Flight. At the time, the 2K community was very popular, so many kids would do anything to have that type of status in the game. He capitalized on this and would tell people that he had advanced accounts with maxed out stats, but when they'd pay him for the accounts, he'd block them and take the money. With all the badges and like 99 overall, like Legend 5 accounts, and then um, I would just post them on there and people would buy them and then I just block them. To promote these scams, he played big tournaments and cheat to win, having viewers throw the game in his favor. Well, I cheated to win, but I still won. How did you cheat to win? Uh, I had people like pull up and throw me games. This is important because although it was minuscule compared to what he'd take part in in the future, it showed that Dev didn't really have conscience and was willing to do anything, literally anything, to make money at the expense of others. However, despite receiving this early success, Dev knew that 2K wouldn't be his main path to stardom or riches, so he decided to embark on his next journey, rapping. He dropped a meme rap song called Track Meet that somehow popped off. It wasn't a serious song, but it still proved to him that he had what it took. So with his new success, he took a new route and changed his YouTube channel's name to OBN Dev. He also realized that even though meme rap was cool, it wasn't what was going to blow him up. So he took to a new emerging bubbling scam rap scene in Detroit that had blown up after digital scamming had increased in popularity over the past couple of years. Dev realized he had to insert himself in that scene, which he'd do multiple ways. For example, he'd pay for multiple features such as with Babytron and Shitty Boys, some of the biggest scam rappers in the scene at the time. But he'd also insert himself by beefing with others. And Dev decided to go straight for the throne, beefing with the at the time king of scam rap himself, TJX6. And it wasn't a small beef either. At one point, Dev had a multiple year long beef with TJX6, the biggest scam rap name out of Detroit. They'd go back and forth on Instagram Live. Dev even made a diss track towards TJ titled Scam Jesus 2. The two scammers even ran into each other in a mall and Dev tried to press him. But TJ was with his kids, so he took the high road. So what's the issue, right? Dev seems to check off the boxes. He was a bad person, had no morals, he scams people, and he raps. What's the issue? Where's the fake image here? Let me explain. It turns out Punch made Dev wasn't exactly being so honest about who he was scamming and that his entire persona was just a character to make money. In other words, he was no different from his 2K days. How do we know this? Well, Dev has a friend named Sache who he'd been friends with since his 2K days, so it's safe to say that they were close friends and associates for years. However, they fell out due to issues involving money, and when they did, Sachi came down hard on Dev and decided to expose him. He began exposing Dev for his shady business tactics, explaining that A lot of people don't know that I did create Punch Made, and I also created OBN. There wouldn't be a Punch Made Dev in general if I didn't exist. He then said that Dev just copies rappers like TJX6 and Babytron and steals lyrics from them, explaining that Dev couldn't be himself and just copied others. He then provided some proof that Dev was just a horrible person. See my story, I posted that Punch Made Dev stole BTB Savage's chain design. You could go ahead and put that on the screen as well. He ended it off explaining that Punch Made Dev, when I met him, he was a simple suburban white boy. He was just listening to Justin Bieber. This man all of a sudden, when he grew up, bruh, he's all acting hard body and he's just cheating on his girl. Dev just scams his fans and has no sympathy for any of his victims, but we already knew that. But wait, there's more. After Dev's old friend Sacha exposed him, his other fellow scammer Wappa, I know, really cool names guys, also decided to expose him. Dev keeps his past life pretty hidden, so Wappa would think it was pretty funny to post childhood photos of Dev, and out of respect for his privacy, I won't show them here. And this was a pretty big hit for Dev, as it was clear he was not a street guy, just a good boy. So Wappa was already clearly showing he was a great troll, but he took things a step further and decided to hunt for Dev. He announced that he wanted to meet up with Dev and settle their differences by giving him the beat. So Dev sent him an address and he was never there. He sent another address, but once again, he wasn't there. So it's safe to say, Dev isn't as tough as he acts. He scams his fans, beefs with other rappers, and hides behind his phone. So 
it's clear he's not living the street life he raps about. But hey, he does scam though, right? Nope. Dev's other friend also explained that Dev doesn't scam and that he simply scams his fans for a living. Yup, Dev doesn't actually do any of the scams. The actual scam are his followers and fans who think he's actually going to give them real methods for scamming. For example, one of Dev's most popular scams is the Cash App glitch, where Dev claims that he knows a secret glitch in Cash App that works as an infinite money glitch. However, Sache exposed Dev, claiming it was false, as well as showing that all of Punchmade Dev's group members in Punchmade flex the same stacks of money in each of their Instagram pictures, making it clear that they weren't actually getting money like that. It should have been obvious that this Cash App glitch was fake. Why would one of the biggest finance platforms in the world have this terrible flaw that would lose itself money? But sadly, many gullible fans deserve it. So Dev doesn't actually scam. His entire persona was made by an ex-friend who now hates his guts. But how is he making so much money? Well, it turns out that's not so original either. You see, back in the day, Dev's arch nemesis TJX6 had a massive telegram chat where people would pay him for his knowledge of scam methods. You'd pay him and you'd get access. So Dev stole this and took it to another level. He created a shop on Telegram as well as a paid group chat for methods. This was a perfect ploy and it worked. Countless people joined his Telegram for the supposed glitch that can make you tens of thousands of dollars in minutes. Many people would send in videos saying they invested their last dollars and that they needed the glitch to work. For example, someone said that it would help their mom in the hospital who had bills to pay or get their family back on the feet. But of course, it was fake and Dev was the only one really scamming. His victims had tough luck. And this is actually insanely messed up. You, you really have to have no conscience to be able to pull this off. And to promote it, Dev dropped a song literally called Join My Telegram Chat. It has over 200,000 followers in it. And if only a small percentage paid him, Dev has likely made over a million dollars. The guy Punch Made Dev stole this from, TJX6 agreed that Punch Made Dev stole his image. So essentially, TJX6, a black man from Detroit who really struggled, walked so a suburban kid from Kentucky like Dev could run. So you're probably thinking, yeah, this dude's entire persona was fake. But what's insane about Dev is literally everything about him is fake. There's absolutely nothing real associated with his image. For example, Dev was recently exposed for having fake Instagram followers, a social media guru named Unlocked who can unban accounts, get accounts taken down, as well as give you fake followers, exposed Dev for paying for his services. When asked who he was, he explained the story. Punch made Dev has come to me multiple times. Because, okay. I'm and he's bought, and, and for the record, f that guy, he's bought fake followers for me multiple times and he's oh, like trying to like yeah, yeah <laughs> he said that dev bought his services multiple times and actually charged people for the same service but he would take the money and not give anything in return damn this guy is just not a great dude but it wasn't just his online presence that was faked it was also his physical appearance or persona punch made dev is known for his jewelry always sporting multiple chains around his neck as well as his grills and other diamonds but as we all know the jewelry game is kind of tricky many of your favorite rappers chains aren't real and punch made dev is not one of them except i hope he's not your favorite rapper for example, many former members of Punchmade Dev's group have come out and exposed Dev for his chains being fake, such as Sache, who explained that all of Dev's chains are fake, as well as the credit card chains that he made for his crew. So it's pretty much confirmed that Punchmade Dev is a grade A douchebag, but what does he have to say? Well, Dev tries to legitimize his wrongdoings by saying that people will get their money back or claiming that the banks are scamming you anyways, which is a weak response. But if his morals are not transparent to you, listen to the stories he tells in an interview. He gives a detailed story of how he scammed a girl at his school who had Down syndrome. So there was this one cheerleader, I won't say her name, but she had so I already knew I could take advantage of her. He manipulated her, took money from her accounts, posted to her social media with racist content, and got her kicked out of the school. It's crazy that kids look up to this guy. He even has a song called Special Needs Kid that talks about scamming and stealing prescriptions from people with special needs. So you're probably thinking, how is all of this legal? Why is this man still a free man walking? If all of his scams are stunts were real, it's surprising that he never got caught up with the law, right? He's been on camera countless times giving in-depth detail on how to scam and has tons of witness stories. So with all of this evidence against him, why hasn't he been charged with these crimes? Well, don't lose all hope yet. Punchmate Dev actually got one of his tutorials taken down by YouTube, but YouTube said it was requested to be taken down by outside sources, aka the feds. So they are watching him, and they only do that to people they plan to throw the book on. So Dev, if you're watching this, watch out. Overall, regardless if he's lying or not, 
He shows sociopathic tendencies and is genuinely kind of twisted. He has no sympathy for his victims or any victims of theft and scams at all. And he's been exposed for almost everything in his career at this point, which is pretty crazy to me. So finally, one thing you'll see with all three of these rappers is they've all gone through multiple personas and phases to get where they wanted to be. They had to experiment until they found an image that best worked for them. It might not be who they genuinely are, but it's what worked. These rappers understand that they need to draw attention and keep the audience entertained. Emotional engagement is such a major piece in marketing and people might not even enjoy the music but they stay drawn in by the antics some can only find success by faking it until they make it there's a great comedy movie named cb4 with chris rock as the main character the movie is about rappers needing to fake it until they make it and it's definitely a great watch if you're interested in rappers fabricating their image anyways let me know what you think about all this down below thanks for watching have a great day see you next time and bye